In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Spirit of Truth, You who are everywhere present and fill all things, Treasury of all that is good and Master of life, Come, dwell within us, Cleanse us from all stain, And save our souls, O good one. Mary, cause of our joy, pray for us. Well, hello. We're going to be working today on the 18th Sunday in Ordinary Time. And uh, the first section will have to do with Verbum Domini, uh, which we've been looking at. I'm grateful for your remarks. The people who have given me feedback say that this is helpful. So, I'm encouraged to keep going. Uh, last week, we started to look at number 17. We're going to finish that today and uh, maybe move on. Uh, the notion in 17 is tradition and scripture. And I, I tried to give some examples. You see, you need a setting for a statement. You see, if I say, stop, what does it mean? Are you running and I want you to stop? Are you, are you a, a crook and I'm a policeman and I'm saying stop? In other words, just that one tiny little word needs a context or it's not very intelligible. Tradition is the context. It carries the word. And it's always been that. And as we're starting to recover that sense, we see, as we'll see when we look at some of these texts today, this very first reading from Isaiah uh, 55 makes an allusion to Psalm 69. If you don't know the tradition, you don't know that. And I've been privileged in my life to study some of the rabbinic writings. And believe me, for a non-initiate, it's really interesting because it's all tradition. Rabbi A states this text, number one. Rabbi B answers with text 14. Now, how do you get from one to 14? You have to know. You have to know how he gets there. And so, it's this, that's what tradition is, you see. It's the Holy Spirit carrying the whole context and carrying the people to enter into the context and understand. And so that's what it is. So picking up from some things I said last week, quoting here, as the dogmatic constitution Dei Verbum reminds us, Jesus Christ himself commanded the apostles to preach the gospel, promised beforehand by the prophets, fulfilled in his own person and promulgated by his own lips to all as a source of all saving truth and moral law, communicating God's gift to them. This was faithfully carried out. It was carried out by the apostles who handed on by oral preaching their example and by their ordinances what they, what they themselves had received, whether from the lips of Christ from his way of life and his works, or by coming to know it through the prompting of the Holy Spirit. It was carried out by those apostles and others associated with them, who under the inspiration of the same Holy Spirit committed the mes message of salvation to writing. It's a living tradition which has a written dimension. Precious, this written dimension. It stabilizes the expression. But, it has to be understood within the context. And I think I mentioned last week how uh, Joseph Ratzinger, talking about this, says, you see, the interpreting subject of Scripture is the church. It's addressed to the church, and it's by God's design. It's the church who interprets it. Now, I think and I'll, I'll do it now. Uh, part of this tradition, again, of Vatican II, and again, uh, 
uh, de verbum. Um, you see, this tradition, the, it's called, in the text, it's the predicatio apostolica, progreditor. The, the apostolic preaching makes progress, grows, whatever word you want in there. You see, progreditor makes progress, you see. And then, three ways. This is a beautiful and famous text. Um, and so, um, it, 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 there are snippets of it quoted here, you see. It makes progress in the church. That's the, um, the way that, that that's the, the wording in English of the, of De Verbum. Uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit. But you see, uh, first, by the prayer and reflection of the believers who carry these things in their hearts. They lift the whole church. All the holy people. I mean, just think of a housewife really loves the Lord. Things are calm for an hour in the house, so she sits down at the kitchen table, starts to read the scriptures, prays, gets understanding, passes it on to her kids. You see? So it's that knowledge that comes by, by pondering these things in your heart, like Our Lady did. The second way that it grows, and this refers to the mystics. You see, it says, uh, um, it's through intimate knowledge of the things which they experience. I think I've told you before, it took about a month of debate to allow that word experience, qua sex veriuntur, into the text. But you see, I mean, this is how the penetration grows. The mystics who are so endowed by God, who are so taught by God, and have a flaming understanding of the realities, say, this is what that text means. Or this is, you see, and it comes alive. That's why there's some very fine books on... Uh, St. John of the Cross's understanding and practice of scriptural interpretation. Very important, you see, because he is experiencing the realities that the text is talking about. He has, for instance, at one point, this beautiful text about those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. Okay? Led by the Spirit, he says, you see, that means that your whole being, your imagination, your memory, your emotions, your mind, your will, is taken over by the Holy Spirit. And you lift it up. He said, now, that doesn't last for a long time in this life, but it's a gift. At that moment, you understand. And because you understand, you speak. Or it can be, for instance, Margaret Mary Alaco, uh, um, Faustine, Sister Faustina, they are both responsible for universal feast days in the universal church, Sacred Heart and Mercy Sunday. Go ahead, look through the whole New Testament and see where it says, celebrate the Sunday after Easter as Mercy Sunday. But they knew that, and they surrendered that to the Pope, and the Pope said, let's do that. So you see how it's the understanding of divine realities that grows. And then the third way is through the preaching of those who, by the uh, apostolic um, anointing or ordination, uh, have received the charism of truth. What a responsibility. Now, they will exercise that charism of truth to the degree that they are pondering the sacred, the sacred text and have a mystical knowledge of it. They can prevent error because we need to be prevented from error. But to have the living knowledge of God and his word and his plan of salvation, we need prayer, mysticism, and the charism of truth. And they can't be divided up. Like, I'll concentrate on the charism of truth. You be the, myst you be the mystic. You pray and fast and suffer and be conformed to Christ. I'll just do my duty and then I'll tell you whether you're right or wrong doesn't work that way. Who have changed the church? Look at the popes we've had in the last few years. You see? 
That's tradition. John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, John Paul the 1st, John Paul the 2nd, Pope Benedict. You see, they are carrying this predicatio apostolica. That's the point that's being made here. The living tradition is essential for enabling the church to grow through time in the understanding of the truth revealed in the scriptures. Indeed, by means, by means of the same tradition, the full canon of the sacred books is known to the church and the holy scriptures themselves are more thoroughly understood and constantly made effective in the church. We've talked about this before. <coughs> the magisterium. The magisterium is a prophetic function. It's not a juridic function. It's a prophetic function. This is the way walking it. And uh, protecting the church, if somebody is producing, promoting error, saying, you're wrong, don't do that, because that is not revelation. Quite a responsibility, don't you think? Ultimately, it is the living tradition of the church which makes us adequately understand Scripture as the Word of God. Think of all the saints who have read this text. Now, you know, in our generation, you know, I've been privileged to learn all kinds of these languages, you know, Hebrew and Ugaritic and Aramaic and uh, huge help. Most of my forebears didn't do that. Jerome learned Hebrew and Aramaic. Never heard of Ugaritic. We only discovered it in 1929. Um, it's a kissing cousin to Hebrew. It's a big help. When we're puzzled about a Hebrew word, to see if there's something like it in Ugaritic. Um, I studied that and um, haven't, I haven't used much. For the first 10 years I did, and now, now I don't. But you see, these are gifts. And as we have grown into a sense of history, we need to bring that to the text. But what that does is give us a living conversation with the text. If I want to know what the person, the text, is really talking about, I have to have my heart in sympathy with divine reality. That doesn't come through Ugaritic or Aramaic or Hebrew or Greek. It comes through purity of heart and obedience to the Holy Spirit. But access, understanding. You see, when Abraham says to God, well, I don't have any children, so Eliot's are here. He will be my heir. Well, we know from the Nuzi tablets that that was the custom in the 18th century B.C., which is probably where that helps a lot. But the real issue there is Abraham's faith. And that we have to experience ourselves. And so that's what he's saying here, you see. Although the word of God precedes and, ex and exceeds sacred, sacred scripture, nonetheless, as inspired by God, it contains the divine word in an altogether singular way. There's something unique about the way Scripture contains, transmits the word of God. That's why in De Verbum, in 21, it says that the church has always honored and reverenced the sacred text, the Scriptures, as she does the Eucharist, which is a very powerful statement. All right? That's what we're, we, we finished uh, with uh, Verbum Domini for the day, and uh, we're ready to move on.